Man, amen. What a blessing. Don't you just love it when our children stand up for Jesus and they're learning amen. how to lift up his precious name. Amen. amen. I'm, I'm excited about this uh, series, The Ripple Effect. I, I was thinking about the kids just a moment ago. So if we could train our children, these were my thoughts while they were singing, to lift up Jesus in the schools or wherever they go so that they could influence the student body like the bullies influence the student body. You know, it just takes one bad apple and it affects the whole bunch. So you take one kid who's got an attitude and his attitude can affect the whole classroom, right? Or affect the whole school, you know? One person can make a difference, you know? Think about all the threats that we're having in our, in our day, in our schools and so forth. It's, think about one and how one person can make that kind of difference. Instead of being a bully, what if we had a kid leave this church today and go out this week and shine for Jesus Christ like the evil that's prevailing in our day? I, I hope you get that picture. Well, that's what I'm preaching about today, the ripple effect of sin, the ripple effect of sin. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. I think you know this account. I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'm going to uh, share it with you this morning in God's Word. Joshua 7, 19, let's all stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy, infallible, inspired, inerrant, everlasting Word. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into, into the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them into Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before, before the Lord. That's a beautiful part, a, a verse to end with reading this morning. And they laid it out before the Lord. What if you and I were just to get real before God today? I'll tell you, if we would get real, then we could get right. Amen. Amen. Let's get real. Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be here today teaching us your word. I pray that we'll not miss you today, but God, we will experience you in your presence like never before. I pray, God, your Holy Spirit now speak to our hearts through your word. Thank you for every person here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I remember years ago hearing the story about this guy. He would pray the same prayer in church every Sunday, and he would pray this prayer. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll remove all the cobwebs out of my life. Get the cobwebs out of my life. And that's all he would ever pray. Well, one Sunday, the pastor called on the same man to pray. And sure enough, he prayed the same prayer. Dear Lord, remove the cobwebs out of my life. Finally, one guy just got fed up. He was through with it. And he stood up and prayed. He won't ask to, but he stood up and prayed in him. He said, Dear Lord, yes, remove the cobwebs out of our life, but kill the spider that's causing the cobwebs. And you know, you got to get to the root or you'll never find out the answer. You know, you got to get to what the real problem is. God gives eternal choices, and these choices have eternal consequences. And the choice you make will affect you for the rest of your life. I tell our youth that. By the way, we've got several out today because of the Operation Christmas Child. They're doing the Faith Riders thing this weekend. But I, I want to say this. If youth could learn this, what a valuable lesson. The choices you make today will affect you for the rest of your life. I mean, just think, just one choice can mess up your whole life. It's important. So God gives eternal choices, and those choices have eternal consequences. Let's give a little background here. As the Israelites are making their final preparation to conquer the land of Cana, the land that God had promised them, uh, their main threat was not some, someone or something from the outside. 
It was not the giants or even the fortified cities like Jericho that they just overcame that would be the primary problem or competition. It was someone on the inside. What was to be a joyous, celebratory occasion turned into a sad, sorrowful story because many lives were lost because of the sin of one man named Achan. The Israelites were given explicit instructions. Here's what the Bible says in Joshua 6, 18. Abstain from the accursed thing. You know, I often have people ask me, well, preacher, what about this sin? What about that sin? Uh, is that really a sin? The Bible says to abstain from all appearances of evil, even the appearances of evil. I had some guys some years ago here, I was doing a new members class, and they said, Pastor, uh, we don't know if we agree with you about uh, abstaining from alcoholic beverages. We don't see anything wrong with that. And I want you to know I did love on those guys, and they're still here today because, you know, you got to meet people where they're at. But it was interesting when I turned the table and I said, what if you saw me and Sherry at a restaurant and we were drinking alcohol? Would that bother you? Well, sure it would, Pastor. That would and by the way, if it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander, all of us, you know, every one of us, it don't matter whether you're the pastor, the deacon, anyone who names the name of Christ, we're to, stay, we, we're to stand for Christ. We represent him, amen? So the Israelites were given these explicit instructions to abstain from the accursed things. And, and, and then it says, there's more, but the precious metals shall come into the treasure of the Lord. Verse 19. The Israelites obeyed except Achan. Achan saw, the Bible says, he coveted, he took, and he hid. Achan may have asked himself, what harm is there if I just take a few of these things? But the ripple effect throughout the entire camp affected every person. His, it affected his family, and, uh, and, and it made God angry, according to verse 1 of chapter 7. Do you know God hates sin? And the Bible says that God was, uh, and with God, it was devastating because the Bible says that God said, I will remove my presence from Israel. You know, I think about what's happening in America, and I think about 9-11. I can't forget about 9-11. And I think about how that we're saying, well, God, why have you forsaken us? Because our sins have separated us from God. And you see, we're living in the most liberal time that I've ever known where people don't call sin, sin anymore. In fact, they don't want no preacher preaching about sin. But I want you to look up here and pay quick attention to what I'm about to say. The person who will tell you the truth about your sin is the one that really loves you and wants to help you. Amen. Just like the doctor, if there's the, even a sign of cancer, what are you going to say to that doctor? Let's get that bugger out of there. Let's, let's take care of that now because it can kill your whole body. Well, such is true with secret sin, and we're going to talk about secret sin today. God's anger burned against the children of Israel in Joshua 7 and 1, causing him to withhold his blessings upon the Israelites as they went into battle with Ai. The result, what should have been an easy victory, instead cost the lives of 36 men, and the hearts of the people melted and became like water, it says in verse 5. Achan's family also paid the price for his sin and, 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 and the loss of their lives as well. Let's not forget this detail. The Bible says the precious metals that were to be added to the treasure of the Lord was God's, and Achan robbed God directly. God had given uh, clear instruction, and, and someone violated them. Every sin we commit is lawlessness, according to 1 John 3, 4. Sin is dis disregarding God's law. It's the attitude, I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and that seems to be the prevailing attitude today. Nothing is private. God sees everything we do, even before we do it. Uh, Hebrews 4.13, and all things are naked before his eyes and open unto the eyes of the Lord. Where are you going to go or what are you going to do that God doesn't see? We can't hide our sins from God, but we can bring them to God. And thank God for Jesus who died on the cross. And we're going to deal with that in just a moment. But first of all, let's deal with the power of secret sin. 
the power of secret sin. Look at verse 19. This is important to understand the meat of this message. It says in verse 19 of chapter 7, And Joshua said to Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. Make confession to me, and tell me uh, now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. The Bible says, Be sure your sins will find you out. The Bible says, What you sow will reap. It's a fact. It's in nature, but it's also uh, a principle of God's word. So number one, the power of secret sin affected uh, Joshua's decision making. A decision for the right. A decision for the right. Notice in verse 3 and 4 of chapter 7, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. Talking about Ai. So they, there went up, verse 4, neither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. Joshua's decision was affected because you see there was a sin in the camp. And that's just like you and I. If there's a sin in, in our church, it affects the whole church. One little secret sin can hurt the whole camp. And that's exactly what happened. The psalmist prayed in Psalm 19, 12, cleanse thy me from secret faults or sins, referring to those sins of which he himself was unconscious. You see, Joshua was not conscious at this point of Achan's sin. And yet Joshua was paying a price. All of Israel was paying a price. Your sin affects us all. Every person's sin. And, and, and I am going to give you a message of hope today, and I hope you'll hang on for it, because there is hope in Christ. And the decision that we make determines our eternal destiny. But the decision for the right. Joshua did not make the right decision. He only sent 3,000 men to Ai. And Ai overcame Israel. And the Bible says the heart of the people was like water and, 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 and they were so discouraged. And that's the next thing. They were defeated and discouraged by the enemy. The, this is the power of secret sin. And Satan will do everything he can to defeat you and to discourage you. And the men of Ai smote of them about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto uh, Shabaram and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Oh, how easy it is to become defeated by our enemy. And Satan loves for us to stay defeated and not deal with our sin, and not, not confess. You see, 1 John tells us if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. But here's, here's the thing about it is, Satan wants to remind you of your failure and your fault, and we're defeated by our enemy because we're not willing to deal with sin. you got to deal with it. And if you don't deal with it, the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. And so we got to deal with it. And that's exactly what happened to Achan. You see, uh, Achan's situation was this. Uh, it's not that, uh, yeah, he confessed it before Joshua, but only after he was found out. You know, it, it, it was a little late, all right? And then third of all, deliverance from the enemy was denied. Deliverance from the enemy was denied. By who? By God, verse 12. Therefore, the children of Israel, verse 12 of chapter 7, could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy the accursed from among you. God's serious. I said, God's serious. You might think that it's okay, but it will affect your family. It will affect your friends. It will affect your church. And I know a lot of people don't like messages on godly living, but friend, as I said about the child, what if we sent one missionary out of here today who could make a difference in our schools and instead of leading others to do wrong, learning them, leading them to do right? And that's our job. That's your job. We're, we're here today to celebrate who we are in Christ so we can go out and make a difference in a lost and dying world. But here's what, here's what uh, God said to Israel. I will no longer be with you if you're not going to deal with this sin, your secret sin. 
That's a strong statement. You know why? Sin separates us from God. God is holy and sin is not. Now I want you to look at this next slide because our secret sins weaken our ability to resist temptation. Look, you may not be able to see that, but I'll read it. No one lives or acts in isolation. I want you to let this sink in. One decision can impact individuals, families, and even a nation. The sin of Achan in 7-1 resulted in a national defeat. In chapter 7, 2 through 12, his family's death. In contrast, a godly man's example can influence his great-grandchildren. Not only his grandchildren, but Psalm 78, 5 through 6 says, For generations to come. Every decision and action has a ripple effect that touches those around us. So don't underestimate. You say, well, I'm just one person, and, 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 and if, if I do something private, uh, it really won't matter. Oh, yes, it will. Oh, yes, it will. In fact, look up here. I'll tell you who you really are. It's when you're all by yourself. That's who you really are. When no one's looking. But in one way, there is no such thing as secret sin because God's always looking. <laughs> God always sees. There is no secret when it comes to God. He, and by the way, look up here. He's the only one that matters, right? I mean, really. So who you are in private says about everything who you are because that's who you really are. All right, then we're going we're to move quickly today. The pride of secret sin. Okay, we've talked about the power. The main thing I want you to take away about the power of secret sin is how it affected the whole uh, nation of Israel and how uh, even the leader, Joshua, could not make a right decision. Sin will keep you from making right decisions, right? Uh, you know what I pray for me every day? Lord, keep me closed, clean, and clear. Keep me close to you. Keep me clear. Keep my mind clear and keep it from being cluttered. And of course, keep me clean. Here's the problem that every person in this building has, including myself, pride. And when it comes down to it, that's the reason there is sin, pride. Remember Lucifer tried to exalt himself above God? He was kicked out of heaven, right? Because he tried to receive the worship that God wanted. Someone said he fell into the choir. But anyway, the, the, the pride of secret sin. Notice what he says in verse 21. Number one, I. Number one, I. I saw. Now, I tried to emphasize the little letter I. Look up here, folks. S-I-N. The little I means I sin. You sin. We all sin. You know, I, I, I won't go there right now. But anyway, <clears throat> I saw. It says, when I saw. Notice the I. I done in verse 20, last part. Verse 21, first part, I saw. Verse 21, um, uh, latter part, I Covenant. You see, pride always goes before a fall. There are those who do, know, do not believe that what one does really matters, but it does. What you do in secret, as in Aiken's case, will affect the whole. Galatians 5, 9 says, A little leaveth leaveth the whole lump. Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction, and a holy spirit before a fall. You see, pride is what's got us in the mess we're in. And yet, we are so Prone. We are bent toward pride. We don't like to even be preached to because no one likes to be told that, that they're wrong about something. We are proud of ourselves. And we, we, we even as Christians, we, we operate in this pride. Well, I'm just as good as anybody else. I, I'm, I'm a good person. I, I do the right thing. We, we, it seems like we build our ego up. Well, I, I'm, I'm okay. I, I'm, I'm this and I'm that. And there's the problem. I, I saw and then I sought among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them. Covenant means to want something that someone else has. He he went after it. He saw it. He could see it at a distance. Jericho was laying there in its ruins, and there is Achan, and he sees something. It's, it's sort of glistening, and it's, it's, it's drawing his attention. By the way, everything that glistens is not gold. <laughs> but you know what? Materialism has, dest has destroyed a lot of people. And you know, some of the most materialistic people I know are those that don't have much. 
Really. Because you know what? They're always wanting more. And those who have the more, they're materialistic because they can't get enough. They want more and more. What shall it profit a man, the Bible says, if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? So, so where's the value of that, of seeking something that the Bible says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not. He sought after that which he was told not to seek. Achan sought after the spoils of Jericho. Pride says, I want it now. That's pride. And that's America today. Can I get a big amen? amen. That's where we are. I got to have it now. I want it now. And if I can't get my way now, I'm just going to throw a fit. I'm just, this, this is not right. Everybody else has got one. I've got to get the, not, the best and the nicest. Sherry said yesterday there was an advertisement. She said $700 off the new smartphone. Is that what it was? Sherry said, I'm smart enough. I'm not going to buy that thing. If they're going to give me $700 off, it must be a lot of money. I mean, you don't have to have the, 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 that's why people get themselves in trouble. They seek stuff that they can't even afford. And that's the problem sometimes. That's just it. They can't afford it and they load themselves. I don't know why I'm saying this. They load themselves down with credit. And this is like Aiken. Aiken thought, well, it won't matter. No one, and he looked, he made sure nobody saw, no one saw him either. I mean, he went. He said, wow, there's gold, there's silver, and I have never seen a beautiful garment like that Babylonian garment. I just got to have that too. And he took it all. And then the Bible says, that was the third one, I stole. <laughs> he says, and I took them. God says in uh, chapter 7, verse 11, and have also stolen Pride is a thief every time. The cost of stealing from God. Pride says the tithe is my money. I earned it. I can do with what I want to do with it. You see, Achan actually stole from the Lord according to the context of the scripture. In verse 19 of chapter 6. Look at verse 19 of chapter 6. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord, and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Israel would have ten major conflicts with the people dwelling in the Canaan land, in the promised land. God is making it clear in chapter 6, verse 19, that the first tenth was to be placed in the treasure of the Lord. And God said, I will get the first tenth, and the other nine will be yours to keep. In other words, God was saying, I will bless you. You will get the fruit of the other nine, but the first goes to me. And folks, I know people don't like to come to church and talk about money. It's not your money. It's God's money. It is. You say, oh, no, I worked for it and I earned it. Well, who gave you the ability to work for it? Okay. Who gave you the mind? And folks, let me tell you something. This is the truth. You came to this world, into this world with nothing. You leaving with nothing. You're not going to take none of these material possessions with you. Amen. It's what you do with it and how God can trust you. And I'll tell you, there's a secret sin in the church today. And we don't see it. Nobody's preaching it today. It's people not tithing. I've even heard of a man who recently said he prides himself in disobeying God. And he says he's a Christian. I pride myself in not tithing. That's a day. I you know what? The Bible says, touch not that. <laughs> I'm not, I don't even want to be around that man. He said, Pastor Ronnie, have you always tithed ever since I was, ever since I became a Christian and I earned my first $1 bill, I learned the value of tithing. I'll never forget this. I was, uh, I was 14, I believe, and uh, just felt the call to preach. And my pastor said, he called me after church Sunday morning. He had an emergency. He said, can you preach tonight? I, I said, yes, sir. Scared to death. This was a rather large church. And so I preached that night. Of course, we had guests there and all. And so the next day, I'm walking down the street in my hometown, and uh, the banker calls me. I said, yep, I've gone from bad to worse. Because see what happened that Sunday, Sunday morning at church, I put my last $10 bill in the offering plate. I didn't have no more money. I'd made $100, and I put that, and I'll be honest with you, I was not joyful about that. I, I, I know the Bible says you're to be joyful, but I thought, how am I going to buy lunch tomorrow? I had no idea how I was going to make it the next week. I thought, well, there goes my $10. 
But I'll never forget this as long as I live, and I think God taught me this for a reason. So I'm walking down the street, and the banker calls me, Miss Nell Cavanus, and she says, Ronnie, you need to come to the bank. I got something I need to talk to you about. And I thought, well, that's great. Now I've written a bad check. So you know how you always assume the things to be bad. So I go into the bank. She says, go to the office. I said, yep, I'm in trouble now. So I go to her office, and she said, Ronnie, when you preached last night, we had a visitor. A lady owns a nursing home there in Fuquay. And she said she felt led to leave this with you when she came in to make her morning deposit from the weekend. And she handed me a $100 bill. I'll never forget that. And I'll be honest with you, I have never stopped tithing since. I mean, God showed me you'll never outgive God. Now, I put my last $10 in on Sunday morning. And by Monday afternoon, this is a true story, I had a $100 bill. God knows how to take care of you. But God will let you, he will, let you live on your 100%. But 100% of devil-infested money will not go as far as 90% of God's blessed money. It won't. It won't. Read Malachi chapter 3. So you say, I didn't know this was going to be about giving today. Well, here's the fact. Achan, he stole what belonged to God. And I dare say that there's a lot of sin in the church today, secret sin. I, I don't know about it because I make sure this is none of my business. I've been accused of all kinds of things. But one thing people never accuse me of, well, he took the money. Because I never have touched a dime that a church has. Don't have nothing to do with no money. But here's the thing about it. There have been many people that have touched God's money and they've stole it. God has not changed about what he said about sin. God has not changed about what he said about sin. You, we have changed as we have deceived ourselves by the hardening of our hearts toward God concerning sin. I want you to listen to this verse and if I've got to listen to this, you got to listen to it. Because God's really calling my name on this, and this is not easy for me to preach right now because I'm talking about my secret sin, all right? Hebrews 3, 12, and 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart or hardened heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhorting one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, I've been studying this scripture. Maybe one day I'll preach on it. But I've, I've been reading this book, uh, Dangerous Calling by Paul Tripp. And he talks about this, and here's what he says. He says, we do not take sin as serious as God does. He says, the blinding ability of sin is so powerful and persuasive that you and I literally need daily intervention. Everyone needs an accountability partner. We must exhort one another daily to godly living. Pride causes isolation. There is no such thing as Jesus in me Christianity. We are all members of the body of Christ, and we need each other to live godly lives according to Hebrews 3.12. Well, here's my sin. For all these many years until I read that book uh, last week, and God just called my name, I've tried to do things pretty much uh, as a pastor by myself. I've thought, man, you know, God called me. i got to stay faithful to him. And uh, I'll tell you, there's been an isolation about me for many, many years because I, I'm like, well, you know, I feel lonely anyhow. I don't feel like I got anybody with me. So God, it's just going to be me and you all these years. And I read this book last week, and I read that scripture about the deceitfulness of sin. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart about the deceitfulness of sin and how, Ronnie, you've deceived yourself because God intended the pastor, too, to be a part of the body of Christ. And he's no different than anyone else. Even though he may be the pastor and he may feel like he's all alone, the fact is you're never alone. And if you don't see yourself as a part of the body, there's no accountability. Now, I've had accountability partners in my life, but I think it's important that the pastor and the church understand that we need each other. We're in this together, and we're supposed to hold each other accountable in such a way that you can come to me and say, Preacher, I want to talk about your sin. And I can come to you and say, I want to talk about your sin. Not in a way to hurt you, but in a way to help you. To say, listen, this thing is hurting you. This thing is destroying you and your family. Maybe you can't see it. Joshua didn't see it. Look up here, church. There's things, and I just revealed my heart to you, that you may not see in your life. 
I may not see my life the way I need to be seeing it. We, that's why I'm saying I need somebody to say, hey, preacher, you know, and by the way, those accountability partners, oh, they love me dearly. The questions were always this. Have you read your Bible today? Have you prayed today? Did you tithe Sunday? Uh, did you witness uh, today? And uh, uh, are you lying to me? That was the last question. Are you lying to me? I mean, accountability. Folks, we need accountability. If you don't have somebody to help you, you will get isolated. And the reason I'm talking about this uh, concerning pride is that you will end up messing up because you feel isolated. You feel all alone. So, folks, we all need each other. And you said, preacher, you just pointed all the fingers back to you. Well, look up here. I've sinned, okay? Now you say, well, I just knew you were a big sinner. Well, guess what? Takes one to know one. Amen. Amen. And we all, we all have sinned. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. I just want you to know that I'm a part of it. <laughs> I'm part of this body too. But if the body has a cancer, you need to cut it out. Amen? You need to deal with it. No one today wants to do that. It, it, does it hurt? Oh, surgery hurts. The Bible says if your eye offends you, pluck it out. What does it say? Your hand? Your arm? Who wants to lose an arm? Who wants to lose an eye? No one wants to lose anybody. But it's a serious thing, friend, when you don't deal with it. Then he says, I stuffed. I stuffed. You say, well, where'd you find that word? Well, it's in the Bible. It says, and behold, in verse 21, and behold, they are hid in the earth of the midst of Matiat and the silver under it. Achan stuffed the stuff he had stolen. Look at uh, verse 11 of chapter 7. And they had put it even among their own stuff. Before we point too much of a finger to Achan, do you have God's stuff among your stuff? Have you, have you taken something? Have you used God's money to pay for your vacation or some bill thinking God will understand? Look up here. I hate to tell you this. Pride, the, 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 the pride of all sin is lying to yourself and to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And God seems to hold, I know sin is sin, but it's a serious thing. Look what happened. And you want to talk about New Testament, uh, Acts chapter 5. In the account is the account of Ananias and Sapphira. And they held back from what they had promised to give. And the Bible says, he lied against the Holy Spirit. And Ananias' life was taken. The wife came in. They asked, what did your husband do? What have you done? And the Bible says the same people that carried her husband out carried her out. You say, well, we're living in a modern day and God don't do stuff like that. Look up here again. God hasn't changed. You say, preacher, you're trying to put the fear of God in us. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I love you. I want the best for you. I really do. I don't want to see you die. I don't want to see anyone die and go to an eternal hell. I don't want to see anyone suffer in this life. I hate funerals. I do. I want everybody to live forever. That's why Jesus came. Amen? Amen. Yeah. You say, why do you hate funerals? I want everybody to live. I want you to live a life that's full and meaningful. And then last, and I'm done. Boy, I'm doing good today. The price of secret sin. But this is a serious price, so we've got to get to it. Notice, first of all, the curse. There is a curse here. Verse 18. And ye in any wise, and ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Can I interpret it in modern language? Or you could say, cause a ripple effect. Ephesians 5.12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Look at verse 13 of chapter 7. There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thy enemies until you take away the cursed, accursed thing from among you. Folks, this is serious business. This is serious business. Think about the curse. <laughs> Would God curse people? Let me tell you, the fact is, they did it to themselves. They took of the accursed thing. And when you and I disobey God, uh, the curse of sin is upon us. It is. 
Thank God that Jesus took care of that. But I'm here to tell you today, we are our own worst enemy. Somehow we think that we're going to, we're something special. We're going to do it different. Uh, we're going to get by with it. <laughs> oh, y'all not laughing. Nobody's ever going to get by with nothing. What goes around, what, what comes around goes around. Yeah, what you sow, what you, we know this stuff, but do we not realize that those things are principles of God, just like the, the law of gravity? You know, what goes up, it's got to come down. Hopefully, if you got a parachute, come down a little slower. But the, the, the curse of disobeying God, but then the consequence. And we do need to see sin as a curse. It will rob you of your life knowing the presence of God. You, you, you're, you'll be robbed of the presence of God, it says here. The fellowship that we need with God and men. But the consequences, verse 22 and 23. So Joshua sent messengers. Here's the consequences. They ran into the tent. And behold, it was hid in the tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them into Joshua and to the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. God gives eternal choices. I'm going to say it again. And these choices have eternal consequences. The ripple effect of sin will always have a consequence. Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sins will find you out. Be sure your sins will find you out. You got to be careful, friend. You got to know that, 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 that any time you make that choice, it's not a matter uh, if there's going to be consequences. There will be consequences. Every, every decision you make. That's why I think it's best to step back. You say, you practice this? I sure do. I, my wife will tell you, uh, I, I am not one that will just jump to something. I'll pray about it. I'll ask God about it. And what, once God tells me, you go ahead and do this, I think I'll do it with my whole heart. That's in obedience to God. Because I do know that the consequences are going to be good. There, there's good consequences, Right? And, and, and if you make the right choices and the healthy choices, you, you, just like your body, if you take care of your body, you know, garbage in, garbage out, healthy food in, you, you're more likely to be more healthy. You, you've got to understand this. There are consequences. There are consequences. Now I want you to look at the slide one more time. And I thought this was powerful, so I put it up there. The world we live in is no steel pond. No person is an island. I'm reading this slow. I want you to let it really sink in. We all make ripples. What kind of ripples are you making? Is your private life a mirror reflection of your public spiritual life? That's profound. The world we live in is no steel pond. No person is an island. We all make ripples. What kind of ripples are you making? Is your private life a mirror reflection of your public spiritual life? Oh, it's easy to look spiritual at church. Well, hey, brother, how are you doing? And then, you know, we both know that you're a gossip. And someone that gossips to you about somebody will also gossip about you. Sure they will. That's who they are. They can't help it. I mean, it just comes out. It's good, you know, and they will eventually have you for lunch. So, so, so you see, people know it, it's going to become like, uh, I guess you could say, Achan wanted that Babylonian garment because you see what's in our heart becomes our clothing on the outside. You see, we're going to be, you, really, no sin is secret. Eventually, it's going to show it. You're going to have a tattletale look. There's going to be a, 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 a way you talk, uh, the way you act. Uh, Aiken probably was nervous. He was probably so ner nervous, he could, he, could, he could thread a sewing machine while it's running. He was probably scared to death. His sins were going to be found out. And sure enough, they were. Because the Bible says it will be found out. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And if you don't come to Christ and let him take your sin costs, then guess what? You will. That's the last thing, and I'm done. The cost. The curse, the consequences, the cost. Verse 25. And Joshua said, why has thy troubled us? He's talking to Achan. 
The Lord, and anytime you see the word Lord capitalized, he's talking about Jehovah God, the self-existing one. The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them, the whole family, with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Secret sin costs Achan, according to verse 24, his money, his family, his livestock, his house. It cost him everything. Sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay. Sin will carry you further than you want to go. And sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Notice the last of verse 23. It says, and laid them out before the Lord. Now I want to say this about costs. Jesus paid the ultimate price for all of our sin. But the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. So here's what I'm going to challenge you to do today. Uh, church, you can continue to own your sin and you will pay dearly. Oh, you will pay all your life because sin has a price. The wages, the, wa the, wa the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you can take the, the price of your secret sin and you can pay for it. Now it won't, You'll never be right with God because you, you're a sinner. Or you could bring your sin to Jesus, the one who paid your sin death on the cross, and be cleansed from all your sin. He died for you. It's a choice that you make. And everybody's fixing to go out of this door. We're either going to choose to receive Christ or reject Christ. Some of you are going to reject Christ today. And there's a fire that just like Achan and his family was burned in. But it's seven times hotter. Hell is real. Sin will always cost you something. Always. You can come to the one who paid the price in full. It cost him, yes, his life. But Jesus paid the ultimate price for all your sin. You say, well, preacher, how can, you, how can I be saved? I'm going to give it to you real quick. I give this same to everybody. you got four bases, four bases. If you don't step on every base, the umpire says, you're out. Base number one, you realize you're a sinner. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, right? So everybody has stepped on base one. Everybody. We're all in agreement. Base one is where we are. We've all sinned. Base number two is the word repentance. Repentance simply means this, turning from your will in your way to God's will in God's way. And the Bible says repent and God will forgive you of all your sin. But you've got to be willing to turn. Just like that base. Base number two, you've got to turn to go to base number three, right? Okay, you're on base number one here. And then you go to base number two. You realize you're a sinner. You, 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 you're on base number two. Oh, I've got to turn to get to base. I'm going to turn from my sin. Then I receive. Base number three, salvation is a gift. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. But wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not done yet. There's a home base, and that's my favorite base. Because my favorite base is the one that I call the base of reconciliation, where we've been made right with the Holy God. Because I want you to get this this morning, church. Jesus is at the, at, at, at the home plate. And when he hits the ball... It it, it's out of the park, man. He died on the cross for you. And I'm telling you, he paid the full price and he hit the ball out of the park for your salvation so that you could be right with his holy father, a holy God through Jesus Christ. And man is reconciled to a holy God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the, he is the star of this thing. He's the one, I'll tell you what, he's better than Babe Ruth. I'm telling you, he's better than any man ever lived on the face of this earth because Jesus, Jesus hit the ball out of the park. And I mean, he did it right. Will you let him save you today? Maybe you've been hiding behind some kind of mask all these years. You've been saying, well, I'm a member of Gord Springs Baptist Church, and you'll bust hell wide open if that's all you got. 
Well, I was baptized by Ronnie Stewart. You'll bust hell wide open if that's all you got. But I'll tell you this. If you got Jesus and you know him personally as your Lord and Savior, then what you have is an eternity full of joy, peace. I'm telling you something, for all eternity, you'll never regret that you made the right choice to receive Jesus Christ. It's your decision. This is the invitation. Father, thank you that I could talk about the cost of sin, but I could talk about the cost that Jesus paid for our sin. And he paid for all of our sin on the cross of Calvary. I pray today that no one would walk out of here saying, well, I'll bear my own cost for my sin. I pray they'll come to Calvary today and let Jesus bear that cost. He's our redeemer. He paid our sin debt in full. God, all we got to do is just come, just like we are. Lord, you don't want us to do anything else because we don't have a leg to stand on before a holy God, but to come to Jesus. He is our righteousness. As we sung this morning, he's the cornerstone. He is the only way that we can be right with a holy God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I pray, Father, that there's someone today who does not know you in pardon and forgiveness of sin, the day they will be saved. I pray for every child of God. They are saved, but there's something that's holding them back. Maybe there's even the curse of a secret sin that needs to be laid out before the Lord today. I pray that someone today would come and lay it out before you, O oh God, and they can walk out of here today saying, I know that I'm clean because of the precious blood of my Savior. Jesus, be glorified at this invitation is my prayer. Amen. You come as we sing.